Good morning everyone. Right, today I'm in Hollybrook Cemetery and I'm afraid we're going to pay another visit to the Titanic because today we are here to see the final resting place of the Titanic's lookout. You know, the famous iceberg right ahead him. We're going to find the final resting place of Frederick Fleet. Right, I don't know if you've noticed, I don't know if the sound quality is any good on this, but I'm having to use my backup camera today because my camera um, wasn't working correctly. So I've had to uh, resort to using my um, GoPro. And I'm having to use an onboard microphone, so if the sound quality is not very good, I do apologise in advance. But anyway, Frederick Fleet, this sort of arms, it's aching. Right, Frederick Fleet. As I said, he was a lookout on the Titanic. Now, he was luckily one of the survivors. He didn't actually perish on that night in April 1912. Um, he was actually on board number, I think it was either number six or number, yeah, number six lifeboat. He was an oarsman on that. Um, but unfortunately, he did come to a sad end eventually. And I'll tell you about that now while uh, I flip you around and we'll have a quick look around and then we'll go and find Frederick Fleet's final resting place. Frederick Fleet was born in Liverpool, England on the 15th of October 1887. He never knew his father and his mother abandoned him and ran off with a boyfriend to Springfield, Massachusetts, never to be seen or heard from again. Fleet was raised by a succession of foster families and distant relatives. In 1903, he went to sea as a deck boy working his way up to able seaman. Before joining the crew of the RMS Titanic, he had sailed for over four years as a lookout on the RMS Oceanic. As a seaman, Fleet earned five pounds per month plus an extra five shillings for lookout duty. He joined the Titanic as a lookout in April 1912 along with five other watchmen. Fleet boarded the Titanic in Southampton on the 10th of April 1912. The ship made two stops, first in Cherbourg, France, and then in Queenstown, Ireland. The lookouts, six in total, made two hour shifts due to extreme cold in the crow's nest. The trip was uneventful until the night of 14th of April 1912. At 2200, that's 10 o'clock, that night, Fleet and his fellow lookout Reginald Lee replaced George Simmons and Archie Jewell at the nest. They were past the order given earlier by 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller to watch out for small ice. The night was calm and moonless, which made it difficult to spot the icebergs due to the lack of waves breaking against the base of the iceberg and reflection. Despite Fleet and his fellow lookouts repeatedly requesting binoculars, they were never provided. This is sometimes attributed to the last minute change in the hierarchy of the ship when officer David Blair was removed from the maiden voyage crew due to the knock-on effect of Henry Tingle Wilde being appointed chief officer without mentioning where the binoculars had been located. It is also speculated that Blair accidentally took the keys of the cabinet containing the binoculars with him Despite both inquiries into the disaster, nothing clarified why the lookouts were not provided with binoculars. Although evidence suggests that White Star Line steamers lookouts did not routinely use them. Some experts have said that even using binoculars, neither Fleet nor Lee could have spotted the iceberg any sooner given the conditions of the night. At 23.39, that's 11.39 p.m., Fleet first spotted the iceberg and rang the nest bell three times to warn the bridge of something ahead. Then using the nest telephone, he contacted the bridge. It was answered by 6th officer James Paul Moody, who asked Fleet immediately, what did you see? He pronounced the infamous iceberg right ahead warning. Moody passed Fleet's warning to the first officer, William McMaster Murdoch, who was in charge of the bridge. After the collision, Fleet and Lee remained on duty for 20 more minutes. 
At midnight, Fleet and Lee were relieved by Alfred Frank Evans and George Hogg. Fleet went down to the boat deck and helped prepare lifeboat number six. Second officer Light Lightoller put quartermaster Robert Hitchens in charge of the lifeboat and ordered Fleet aboard as well. As they were lowered away, Hitchin and American socialite Margaret Brown, that's the unsinkable Molly Brown, realised they were only two sailors, including Fleet, to man the boat, and called for another sailor to be sent. As no able seaman was near, Canadian Colonel Arthur Godfrey Puchin volunteered to join the boat, saying he had experience in sailing. He was ordered by Lightoller to reach the boat by climbing down a rope. Once away from the sinking ship, the boat tried to reach the lights of a ship in the distance, thought to be the SS Californian. While Hitchin remained at the tiller, Fleet and Puchin managed the oars. Arguments and problems arose on boat six as quartermaster Hitchins kept insulting and mistreating the rowers, including Margaret Brown and Helen Churchill Candy. Later in the night, there was an argument about whether to return for survivors, with Hitchins warning against returning or for fear of being swamped by swimmers. The lifeboat finally reached the RMS Carpathia by 6 a.m. on Monday, the 15th of April, 1912. After the disaster, Fleet underwent two inquiries. First, the US inquiry. Secondly, the British Wreck Commissioner's inquiry. In the United States, he was questioned by Senator William Alden Smith, who, to whom he repeatedly said that he that had they been equipped with binoculars, the disaster would not have happened. Before the British inquiry, he underwent a long examination but refused to answer many of the questions. Lord Mercy, chairman of the commission, concluded Fleet's interrogation by telling him that he was grateful for his willingness to answer questions despite his wariness when responding to every question. Fleet replied with a sarcastic, thanks. Fleet served on the Titanic sister ship RMS Olympic before leaving the White Star Line in August 1912, after noticing that the company treated those involved with the Titanic differently. For the next 24 years, he sailed for different shipping companies, including the Union Castle Line. Fleet served on merchant ships throughout World War I. Later, he was a ship's lookout again on the Olympic during the 1920s and early 1930s. When he left the sea in 1936, he was hired by Harland and Wolfe to work at the company's shipyards in Southampton. While working there, he lived with his wife's brother. He served again during World War II. Later, closer to retirement, he became a newspaper salesman and experienced financial difficulties. Shortly after Christmas, on the 28th of December 1964, Fleet's wife died and her brother evicted him from the house. Consequently, Fleet fell into a downward spiral of depression. He returned to his brother-in-law's home and hanged himself in the house's garden on the 10th of January 1965. Fleet was buried in a pauper's grave at Hollybrook Cemetery in Southampton. This grave remained unmarked until 1993, when a headstone bearing an engraving of the Titanic was erected through donations raised by the Titanic Historical Society. And his headstone is where we are going to visit today. Right, well let's go and find his final resting place. I know it's down here somewhere. Um, I have seen a picture of this headstone. I know it's got a picture of the Titanic on it. This looks familiar in the pictures. Uh, we should have a little wander around. Right, Frederick Fleet, he was, um, he was a relatively unknown as far as the general public are concerned. I mean, everyone's heard of the Titanic and its sinking and over a thousand people dying and all the rest of it. But how many people actually thought about the lookout? You know, the uh, the one that shouted about the iceberg being right ahead. I mean, everyone thinks about the unsinkable Molly Brown and a couple of other characters that were on it because obviously they were the rich people on there, which was a thing in those days. Right, I think it's across here. Take a walk across. This is where it's going to get a bit treacherous, I think. But, um, yeah, Frederick Fleet, he had a, a very sad ending. I mean, his brother-in-law, as soon as his wife died, his brother-in-law threw him out into the streets. I mean, how bad is that? How bad is that? Right, well, I think I can actually see the headstone now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spin you around 
and we're going to have a look at it together. Right, I think it's up ahead here. Oh, this is a bit treacherous along here. Uh, I know it's a white headstone. I think, yeah, I think I can see it over there. All right, let's uh, walk over here just to make absolutely sure it's none of these, which it isn't. Oh, yes, I can see a picture of the Titanic. Right. It's just over here. I don't want to walk across anyone's grave. Oh, yeah, Frederick Fleet. Here he is. It's actually a really nice headstone. Frederick Fleet, 1887 to 1965, lookout, RMS Titanic. Erected to his memory by the Titanic, by the Titanic Historical Society, Inc. Indian Orchard, uh, oh, Massachusetts, USA. And look at that, someone's actually put a little Lego Little Lego Titanic next to the headstone. What does this say? In memory of RMS Titanic and all who, sa all who sailed in her, the officers, officers and members of the Titanic Historical Society, Inc., nearer my God to thee. Right, and as per usual, I don't want to stand on his grave, just come around this side. Just put my river polished pebble on there, which I now have done. But there you go, that is the final resting place of Frederick Fleet. A very, very sad story. Well, there we go, that's the final resting place of Frederick Fleet. It was a very, 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 very sad story. I still can't believe that his uh, brother-in-law threw him out into the streets after his wife had died. I mean, he was broke, broken-hearted, and now homeless as well. Really, really sad. I know I would never advocate anyone doing um, what he did, but I can kind of understand why he did it. But anyway, that's the final resting place of Frederick Fleet. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. So I'm just watching where I'm going because I'm going to embarrass myself in a minute. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a thumbs up. Uh, it would be very much appreciated. And if you haven't already done so, then maybe consider, consider subscribing. And if you do, then don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you will be notified whenever I upload a new video. Um, and if there's anyone that you want me to go and visit, then please let me know in the uh, comments below. Um, right, well that is it from Hollybrook Cemetery in Southampton. I will see you all on the next one, hopefully. So until then, bye bye for now.